This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. Well, welcome, Gary, and how are you this I, beautiful Sunday morning? I couldn't be better, Mark. How are you? I'm I'm excellent. I'm in New York. Uh, I've got uh, plans today, so but I wanted to talk to you and uh, see what uh, what interests you today. You know, I we tried reaching out to an author who I read something about that I thought that it piqued my curiosity, and maybe a week ago. And I think he's a professor at University of Texas. Do you remember what the, this guy that we were trying to reach? Yeah, I do. Uh, and I believe that we still probably have the option to have him on. He was uh, he he's a professor at the University of Texas, as you said, and he sent out a series of tweets that you uh, retweeted and uh, encouraged people to read. And he was basically pointing out that there are reasons that people in the defense community might be uh, reacting to the Donald Trump indictment in a way that some might not expect. Yep, I, which is, um, you know, I have these, uh, I'm surrounded by people who are kind of cheering on the prosecution. And uh, as a criminal defense lawyer, I've been very, uh, I, even though I've been accused of cheering it on, I wouldn't ever say that I cheer anybody getting prosecuted. Uh, but there is a, there's been kind of a um, schizophrenic dichotomy, if you will, about the prosecution or the uh, idea of chasing somebody, um, prosecutors chasing somebody uh, on um, on a basis of which that criminal defense lawyers would have a blanch at. And I know that I'm not the only I've talked, I won't name them, but I've talked to some other prominent criminal defense lawyers who have a very similar situation that I have where either their wives or people that they know are uh, adamantly cheering on the prosecution. And as criminal defense lawyers, they have a real problem with a lot of the things that have gone on here. Uh, and when, and people say, well, what do you mean? And they'll say, well, if this were take out Donald Trump and just make it Donald Jones, would this be a case that they would expend the resources, uh, in the Manhattan DA, for instance, to have, uh, Cobble together this theory to elevate misdemeanors to felonies. I don't think they would. I, I don't think, and you know, it would be interesting. Maybe I'd have Karen back on here and do a little give and take on that. But, uh, and, and she would give you the prosecutorial view, but I will give you, I will tell you that there are a lot of, uh, us in the criminal defense community. I know people always say, well, you know, kind of the default to, uh, the kind of a parody or caricature of what criminal defense is, but criminal defense really at its essence is holding the government accountable and making sure that the government has to prove their case and that you have certain, uh, at least arguably immutable principles upon which you, uh, you're, you're kind of defending, uh, whether that is that you hold the prosecution to um, uh, they're having to go over the very proving the elements of their crime, making sure that, you know, the kind of the long running argument that, uh, that I've been making with Adam over the last 10 years, uh, about a budget and that if prosecutors had a budget, you, know, I think that in a lot of ways you'd see a different, uh, take on the, uh, prosecution of, of, uh, criminal defendants. And it's an interesting, um, discussion to have especially in the context of progressive so-called progressive prosecutors because you know you've got the in uh, Los Angeles you've got George Gascon you've got the um uh the Rico the successful recall of the San Francisco district attorney and now you have um Alvin Bragg and basically since Friday, do you have whip, whiplash, Gary, about the situation? Kind of, why don't you, why don't you re, regale us with what actually we were discussing and then what happened within the hour afterwards? Yeah. You know, we had Alex on, uh, Alexander Kazarian on, on the show on Friday afternoon and we were all talking about the, uh, the ruling that, you know, Justice Alito, uh, dissented on and it was, <laughs> It, by the time we finished recording, I stopped and 
while the video was processing and editing, I went to my son's karate class. And by the time I got back and posted the episode, it was about 15 minutes before the whole world blew up and everything that we had said was now completely void. And, and now all well, it was sudden- looted out. And the second circuit had come in. The second circuit had stayed the district court judges opinion where the district court judge had excoriated basically the the Manhattan DA for trying to quash the subpoena of Pomerantz, who was the prosecutor who resigned, special prosecutor who resigned, wrote a hook. And then Jim Jordan using the hook that the prosecution here, the state prosecution, the the uh, Manhattan DA had used fifty thousand dollars of federal monies uh, on the budget for the prosecution, gave them the oversight ability. The uh, Alvin Bragg took that to the Second Circuit. They actually issued a stay before we could even. Well, we did talk about it. A half an hour later, that they entered into a settlement and, right. and- basically said Manhattan General Counsel would accompany Pomerantz to the hearing. And what what exactly – help me out there because is that just – is that theater or – I mean couldn't Pomerantz – doesn't Pomerantz presumably understand the the rules and the, the privilege that is held by that office? What is What is so special about having the general counsel of that office sitting there that would allow Alvin Bragg to just completely back off and drop his guns after I believe a 50-page lawsuit that – you know, I mean, well, I get look the cynic in me, even though it was stayed normally when it stayed and they wanted briefing, I believe within two days. Yeah. So the, the they wanted a briefing was the second circuit. Second circuit wanted briefing within two days. Sometimes you would think if you're trying to read the tea leaves, which is awfully tough when it comes to appellate work. Uh, the you know I can't tell you the number of times I've argued in front of an appeal uh, or appellate uh, panel and thought that uh, I was losing and I've won and vice versa. But I would have thought that they had some confidence that they were going to get that a change there. But boy, I think I know they tried to spin it as a win, but it certainly did not look like a win to me because, as you say, big deal, having the general counsel there. Pomerantz is not exactly a um, a storefront lawyer. This is a top-rate, first-class lawyer who knows what he's doing, can handle himself, and is not going to be scared of anybody else. uh, And I I I had the same reaction, but in a different way than you. I was perplexed as to why they came so early. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm sure More quickly, I guess. Correct, and I'm sure that our our confusion comes from very different places because you're, you know, I'm informed by a much different uh, set of circumstances than you are. But yeah, you know, I saw the different statements from both Jim Jordan's committee and from uh, Alvin Bragg's office. It was just, it was a little bit perplexing to me how it seemed like something very minor that, that uh, the Jordan committee conceded to. And all of a sudden Bragg's office was just, con- was just all of a sudden, okay, well then no problem. Yeah. Everything's, this is a win and everything's fair and just, I, I just, I don't, I didn't quite follow. Well, I, you know, the, the cynic in me also feels like if the second circuit got involved to reverse the district court, obviously the next stop is the Supreme court. And, that district court opinion, I thought, you know, once again, here's the criminal defense speaking, not the liberal Democrat. So I'm going to give the those uh, who would make crimes. Uh, I will tell you that district court was right on all counts, even as uh, uh, it's been. I, I I forget who I was watching, but I was watching some commentary on it. And, we're trying to be dismissive. In fact, I saw, and I forget her name, maybe we could find it for Tuesday. I saw an ex Manhattan DA, not Karen, talking to, and she was almost crestfallen by the fact that a, uh, a, a New York federal district court judge had not kind of fallen in line with the, uh, with the, 
the ideological um, spectrum that you that you know Trump makes bad law law in order to get Trump, and so I wonder if they. Bragg didn't understand or did understand, I should say, that the uh, that you could have headed to the Supreme Court and that would have been a uh, full-blown disaster on an expedited basis. What we also have this week in the same district here in New York is the beginning of the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit, where it has been interesting. There's been some um, developments there as well. You might remember, I think we talked about this, Gary, that the she had answered that nobody's paying her expenses. Now it turns out that there there are people who were paying her expenses. I saw where George famously was or is married to Kellyanne, uh, was um, the one who, or at least has been given credit, and I think grudgingly admitted that he takes credit for steering her to uh, Roberta Kaplan, who's a very well-regarded lawyer here in New York who's prosecuting the case for her. And it turns out that, in fact, there was some litigation funding. And that's a, and so the judge carved out some uh, deposition for that. And then we talked about the fact that Trump was writing a letter that he didn't want to unnecessarily crippled York when he comes here. Uh, but he's got a lot on his plate, if you will, because at the same time, Georgia is heating up uh, this week. And it looks like there are people that have been identified as targets who at least one, based on the public filings, may be cooperating. So you'll need a full-time law firm, national law firm, to defend against all of the incoming legal scud missiles that are headed his way. Yeah, right as he ramps up for the uh, for the new campaign, I'm sure it'll be interesting. Uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you about: Did you read anything into the fact that in the uh, Alvin Bragg situation, once the agreement was reached, that they actually pushed off the Pomerantz uh, deposition by, I believe, two weeks or so? I, I think I saw May twelfth. Right, that's what I saw. Uh, I did. I think that there's some. There's still negotiating, or there are some further. About the terms of the Manhattan Deep surrender, if you will. And uh, they they probably have said, okay, now that we got the lawyer, we want to do this, that, or the other. But um, they've lost, uh, the Manhattan DA at least has lost whatever leverage they had by that was issued by or that was in connection with the stay. Yeah. yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me if they're making some kind of a calculation um, that Georgia will take the heat off of. The, any testimony the public may give that you know that is a hearing that I would want us to cover uh, gavel to gavel, so to speak, because uh, to me that is the essence of the prosecutor's duty role and what was done or not done. Yeah, I mean, we can take a dive on Tuesday into some of the language the judge used and what she invoked at the district court level about the. Um, uh, the things he wrote in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And that sounds like exactly what Beyond a Reasonable Doubt was founded for, to uh, do a gavel-to-gavel uh, coverage of, of something like that. So I think we will do that starting on Tuesday. Mark, thank you so much for your time on a Sunday morning. We appreciate it. You got it. Thank you, Gary. And everybody have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash Podcast.